Mark McKee. This is called Skull and Banana, um, also known as uh, Powell Ripoff series, Skull series from Blind, Mark Gonzalez's board. I definitely did Rudy's last. I think I did the Dodo Skull. F no, I, I think I did this one first, yeah. I had the idea all on the same night. Rudy's with the Jock Skull where he's wearing a football helmet. I had that one like afterwards because the first idea that we had was Per Willander Skull, Screaming Skull, the Viking Skull. But he didn't have a football helmet on, he had the same helmet and he had like, um, like dental braces on, like with headgear. Like I drew that one, you know, I completed it, but then we were really worried about the copyright infringe infringement uh, potential uh, of the series, so Steve had me change Rudy's graphic with the dental, because it was the same skull, but just with like the, the braces added to it, we thought that wasn't a big enough change. Yeah, I think it's in Clyro's book, Disposable. I would have to say this one because it was like <laughs> a rare honor to do one of Mark's graphics because like he usually does all of his graphics himself. So that was huge. Like in the interview that you did, like you handed it to him and uh, I don't remember what he said. I just think that he didn't want to comment on it and he just handed it back to you. And I kind of get where, you're, where he's coming from because it's like, this graphic, like, it isn't really about Mark. This is more just like being mischievous and making fun of Powell. And Mark allowed me to do it for him. But Mark's whole like artistic persona is like, it's not this. Well, you got to ask the question, yeah. you know. <laughs> you hold that up. Uh, this is a VHS copy, I guess that they only existed in VHS of Love Child, uh, World Industries video. Did they turn pro, like Daywan and Shiloh and everybody turned pro before this came out? So it was like their premiere as being new pro riders for World Industries, 92 I think. This cover, it's like a baby zebra. So Rocco came to me with the idea, there's a song called Love Child by Diana Ross, and it's about a child born to an unwed mother, so that's what a love child is. But somehow, like, we all had the impression that, like, a love child was an interracial product, an interracial marriage or couple. Then Rock was like, yeah, draw a baby zebra, you know, black and white combined. The original drawing I did had the parents, too. I just, like, <laughs> decided, like, I didn't want that as the cover because I just thought that, like, portrayed the offspring of an interracial couple as a freak of nature, like a, an animal. So we just went with the, the zebra instead. Yeah, it was. Maybe one of the only times, but yeah. Um, yeah. We made t-shirts, but we never sold them. We did a graphic for Brandy Colvin, and it was, uh, <laughs> I took like a Teen Beat magazine cover of showing the New Kids on the Block, which is a boy band that was really popular in the 80s and 90s. And uh, so we took just the picture from the cover of the magazine, and for the t-shirt, <laughs> I put a swastika <laughs> above their heads, and we actually made shirts like that. And this one guy, I remember, like, got one of the free shirts and, like, went into a, a record store. And, like, I think he got, like, kicked out of the record store. Like, the record store people were like, what the fuck are you doing here with that shirt? So we never made that. Um, I think I still have the film set of it, though. Um, but, yeah, that was a good call not to do that. Uh, it's been years and years, yeah. I guess <laughs> maybe my, my favorite part is when they're, like, because it d documents like part of like when, when they went on tour with Steve and he was totally spoiling them, like taking them on shopping sprees. And they're, they're like in a hotel room, like on the balcony, like throwing shit down in the parking lot. Oh yeah. Maybe personality wise, Jeremy Klein. Actually that's before Love Child, but yeah, day one of course. Probably two years ago when I, still work there. He would come in the office all the time. Yeah, Kareem Campbell kicks KCKs. <laughs> I don't remember really working with him on it. I don't know, I just probably came up with it. And I was actually thinking about this the other day uh, when you mentioned it. 
like these leaves. Um, originally, I, I drew, I drew um, like copied the crest from the Cadillac logo from the car. I must have thought like that was too similar because <laughs> it was the exact same. And then these were meant to be weed leaves, but they're only like one of the seven or so parts of the weed leaf. So that was the idea, but it doesn't really make much sense because that's not even the good part to smoke and it's only one part of the leaf. You can't even really tell unless I just explained it. <laughs> I don't remember, remember them being that popular. Yep. This was before action, I guess? Yep. I don't know, like, <laughs> when the whole shoe thing took off, that really shifted the fo like, Rocco's focus. That was like the mid-90s. Board graphics came out much more frequently and they weren't as important anymore. And then shoes were really bringing the money and like keeping the lights on. So me and Sean were like, we weren't really that interested in like skate shoes that much because like the, you know, the attention had shifted from, from boards. Yeah, this isn't like, you can't really get that creative like with a, such a small space. Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. I can't really remember taking any of those shoes. Like, I think I might have still been like wearing Adidas shell toes or something at the time, or Pumas, I don't know. Vans, maybe. Well, now that you asked me, I probably would, but I probably wouldn't like seek them out. I guess the woman like sitting in this wicker chair, <laughs> she's holding a bong. That was actually the bong that I bought like on Melrose Avenue. That was like highly detailed and he en ended up buying the original art. So it's hanging somewhere in Texas where he lives. I presumably. It's been a long, long time, yeah. He's pretty sick, re reclusive, I guess, or just inaccessible. Oh, sweet. <laughs> so this is the book, I guess, children's book, that Chris Pastis brought in and wanted uh, for his graphics. So it's got all these babies with their activities. <laughs> and so this became Chris's graphic. And originally I had like seven or eight of them, like of these vignettes like all in one graphic and then I think maybe Steve wanted um, just to use like a singular image like for the board so he went with the sitting one that was his first graphic I think doing his first graphic we made like an industrial size board which is a bigger size model with a stretching baby but originally I, I drew Dune versions of all these different characters yeah it became annoying not so much in this case because like I was able to change the graphic like so that it looked like Dune as a baby for me, I like coming up with my own ideas more than <laughs> just having ideas like fed to me. <laughs> Why does it say Hangar, oh, Hangar 18 is a shop? Yeah. Not really. I think I only did three graphics <laughs> for him. Like I did this one and then the sitting one was his first graphic, then this came out. And then there was another one that came out afterwards called Dangerous Dune Graphics was the title I gave it. And that was my idea because I kind of got this idea that um, he was, I don't know, like kind of fucked with a little bit. There's definitely like click aspect with some of the team members and maybe Dune was, I don't know, for some reason I had this impression that he had like a really timid aspect to his personality. So the Dangerous Dune like shows four different frame uh, pictures of uh, like running with scissors, but then there's safety scissors, you know, for kids, so not really that dangerous. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Javante Turner, uh, EMB local, I guess. Uh, so he's skating his board. This was called Javante Turner at Night Graphics. He came to me with, me with this idea. He's like, you know, like the joke about like black people is like, you see them at night and you, they smile and all you can see is their eyes and teeth. So he wanted that for his graphic. So it's just all black with the white eyes and teeth. Um, but before this graphic came out, the source of this um, smile, smiley face, which was called, is the ad in here? I thought the uh, ad was in here. Yeah. There it is, yeah. So the board was entitled The Napping Negro. So. <laughs> It was intended as just like, to be like a, a racist collector's item. So here you have a picture like with all the negative African-American stereotypes and he's like lying in a watermelon patch. So it was just intended as a joke. And so <laughs> this whole story was written by Rocco about to appeal to the supposed collectors that would be um, interested in this item. You know, they're, they're longing for the olden days where this was like prevalent. Uh, well, it was my idea to go to this extreme, and actually, I had originally thought that um, it was his idea because he had this um, 
postcard that had a picture of a, bo a little black boy in a watermelon patch. He had shown that to me in Rocco, but recently um, came to light that this guy, Neil Brown, this guy from Alabama that was a skater back in the day, he sent that postcard to Steve as an idea for a graphic because he was just a fan of World Industries. And uh, he actually had an article in the first Big Brother magazine. So he, he had found this postcard in a gas station in Alabama and he sent it into World Industry, like kind of like to show like, look what the fuck is still going on in the South. Like this shit is still like for sale. And so, you know, Steve liked it. And then I just went with the idea and made it more extreme. Yeah. Oh, def definitely, yeah. <laughs> Especially because it says style on it too. I mean, it's, it's talking about Javante, but it's just like pretty awesome. I don't remember. <laughs> I mean, usually the graphic is like grinded or board slid, so you can't really see it. Yeah, there's been a lot of different iterations of this graphic recently. What is this one called? It's called Lowriders, because of the Lowrider cars. I think I copied those out of a Lowrider magazine. It was a popular mag in LA back in the day. Lowrider cars. And the, this is, a, um, well, I guess it says right there, 63 Chevy Malibu, I think. And that, that's a 64. This Honda Civic is Daywan's car. <laughs> and the street is a street that I used to live on in Culver City. I took a photograph of the street. Back then, like, for photo references, like now I just go, go on Google Images, but back then I would go out with a camera and take Polaroids. This is intended to be a school because, like, you know, the kids are, like, crossing the crosswalk, crossing guards there. Um, this is really um, the Sony Studios. It didn't really have the windows there. I put the windows in to make it look like a school. Uh, that's the apartment building I used to live in. I wanted to get a photograph of a crossing guard. And this is like back then, like how things were so much different. Now people just like take pictures of everybody all the time and post them on the web. So I saw a crossing guard and I asked to take her photograph just so I could get like her getup, you know, or her uniform. And she's like, no, I don't think that'd be right. <laughs> like what would be the harm in that? But so I, I don't know where I got that image from. Did you have them do that? Uh, well, yeah, they're pretty much improvised. Like, I don't, these are nothing, but this one is, says Reem 1, so that's Kareem's tag, Kareem Campbell. And then uh, another uh, technical thing that, like, kind of, this is kind of, like, really trivial thing that bothers me after I do, gra do a graphic. When you're crossing the street with a crossing guard, they lead the kids across the street, and then the crossing guard stops in the middle of the street and just sta stands there with the stop sign and, until the kids complete crossing the street. But here, he's just, like, trucking on all the way across the street and not stopping in the middle like he's supposed to. Yeah, that's the main theme of this graphic is the contrast between the innocent kids and what they're probably gonna become like later on. I think this was only eight. I think this might've been the most colors I used up to that time. Yeah, but I don't think, I sold it more recently so it wasn't you that buy it. Yeah, there's actually another phase before that, which is also in pencil, but it also had like um, Xerox copies. Cause like what I would do is like, I draw the kids separately, make a Xerox of the drawing and then cut out the Xerox copy. Probably three weeks. Well, maybe it didn't take three weeks. Like probably over $2,000. I don't know, it's not that there haven't been a lot of bad ones, but it's just hard to think of the absolute worst one. Just any of the ones where, where it's just like somebody hands you a, a picture to bank logo or something to copy. Um, like I didn't do this graphic, but Krager had a graphic that was like the Union Bank logo. And uh, the reason why he wanted it was that was like his favorite nighttime skate spot, <laughs> the Union Bank parking lot. So that, that kind of thing was going on like in the mid 90s. So. Not a lot of creativity there. For plan B? Yeah. No. Well, they just wouldn't have asked me, I don't think. Yeah, probably not. Because like, even like kind of Nottis like put this into effect where Cliver had done a graphic for Sean Sheffy. 
And up till then, Sean was doing like a, a lot of the 101 graphics. You know, we had all these different brands under the same roof of World Industries. There was like Plan B, Blind, 101. Back then, each brand had like a really clear identity to it. And Nautis was worried that like Plan B would start looking like 101. Like as artists, we would kind of like do stuff more exclusively for like one or two companies, but not all the companies. That changed later, and I think it really kind of hurt like the artistic direction of the company. But um, yeah, so I didn't do any Plan B graphics. Is this a Bob shirt? <laughs> oh. Hi, guy. No, I don't think so. I, I mean, he was so young at this time. I think that he's like 14 years old. So I, I think at that age, you know, obviously he's not like using drugs or anything, but he was probably just like fucking stoked to be skating and being in the blind video and getting a graphic. There was some footage, um, like in the Man Who Sold the World documentary, of Guy actually shot by Spike Jones posing for like a, a video reference for me to copy of draw his face and you can see it like it's in part of the video where he's kind of has this like expression on his face and he's like in the alleyway beside the, the building uh, the world building building you think of those Bob shirts? Horrendous, yeah this was in the, the days of like you know big pants small wheels and these shirts were sewn in our building like we, we had our own like sewing department with all these like Latina women <laughs> making t-shirts and they didn't get like the right elastic or something for the the collar so they'd stretch out I don't know there's some movie in the 80s where like a girl's like a dancer and like the fashionists have like really huge sweatshirts but with the, like huge flash neck rings dance. flash dance <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah so this is an example of like a graphic that like, I wasn't too keen on the idea. Um, I, I don't think it was Guy's idea. This was Guy's graphic, though. Maybe it was his idea. But this was a movie that came out in the 90s starring uh, Kim Basinger. It was called Cool World. Yeah, she was a cartoon in the, in the movie. It's like a combination of uh, animation and live action. This is uh, Jessica Rabbit from Roger Rabbit. So they had, like, another movie that was, like, not a knockoff, but, like, the similar technique, where it's part animated and part live action. This came out earlier, uh, Roger Rabbit, which is, like, classic but then cool world like they that came out like right during the 90s so this was happening and like that's an example of like a skater like just seeing the movie and just wanting it for his graphics and I didn't like the movie <laughs> like I went to see it with Nottis well the way that they, they animated who framed Roger Rabbit was they shot all the live action first and then they went back in with the animators and they had like the images so they could like sync the drawings with the live action like exactly but they didn't do it that way with Cool World. I think that they, they did it like simultaneously. So like we were joking, like when they shook hands, it looked like this, you know, <laughs> like it just wasn't in sync. Um, so then this is a t-shirt that came out for the graphic, but the board graphic was different. It was like Lady Wrestling and uh, Jessica Rabbit was kicking, Holly Wood was her name, kicking her ass. And then, you know, the, the other um, supporting characters from each movie are like rooting them on. I liked the, the final result, um, but yeah, I just didn't want to just copy a crappy movie. Yeah, I haven't seen him in a long time. Ten years, maybe. Big Brother number one, first issue. I have two of these, I think. I think Pat Rocco, I had one that I saved and then Pat Rocco gave me uh, a copy of his. Yeah, I did work on this one a bit. I think, I, I think maybe the only thing I did was write this subscription ad. Oh, I did this board review. <laughs> That's me <laughs> from the 90s, 90s me. We went to uh, this place in Santa Monica called the Third Street Promenade. It's like an outdoor like shopping mall. And we brought skateboards with us and we got, just got like people on the street to review the graphics. Oh yeah, I guess this is another article that I wrote. How to get graphics. This is our first issue, so we didn't know what the fuck we were doing. I had no idea you know, what to do for a magazine. I mean, obviously you shoot skateboarding photos and interview skaters, but we didn't do any of that in here. Well, we shot some photos, I guess. Obviously not, because when the end product came out, Rocco uh, affixed this sticker saying no one here had any idea what in the hell they were doing, so it's uh, declared a total failure. <laughs> yeah, issue number three, um, Big Brother, Day One Song. Right when this came out, uh, Thrasher released their 10th anniversary issue because it was, you know, uh, actually their 10th anniversary so we decided to put the same thing on our cover which is actually only our third magazine <laughs> it had only been out for two years <laughs> maybe a year and a half it might have been Jeff Tremaine's idea I don't know 
for the first like seven or eight issues, we changed the format each time. Um, so this one had a spiral, like a wire spiral binding, and uh, it might have, but that's the time when we were like flying high and <laughs> money was no object. I think he just enjoyed the novelty of it. Like it, I think it was probably it's Steve's insistence that we change the format every time. I think that was his idea. Uh, the ad in Trans World was um, of Gabriel Rodriguez. You know, back then they'd shoot tricks sequ sequences on with a film camera. You know, you couldn't just shoot like 99 takes because that would cost a lot of money for film. So all that he uh, came up with was just like a, a proof, a contact sheet where he's bailing the same trick three times. It was a two-page ad, so that was on the right-hand side, and then on the left-hand side, a portrait of Gabriel holding a 44 Magnum to his head, like crouched in a corner, like he's going to commit suicide. I remember like overhearing the phone conversation with Steve talking to the guys at Transworld. You know, they were telling him obviously that they weren't going to run it. Like Steve said that the guy, it might have been, I think this conversation was with Fallahi. I don't think it was with Larry Bama, but he also did talk to Larry Bama. Obviously like Larry Bama is the one that shut it down. But he was talking to like, this other guy that was like their, I don't know, some employee. And he, he was like, I don't know why you, you have Gabriel like with a gun to his head. He's like pulling off this rad trick. So like Steve was like incensed that like he didn't even notice that the sequence was three bales. So that's the kind of thing that would drive Steve crazy. We ran it in one of our catalogs, that two-page spread, but then then Steve's like, fuck it, like we'll just do our own magazine at that point. Yeah, Eric Costin. This was when Rave music was really big. It says 101 Rave. And this kind of ad layout was like popular with all like techno music. Shit. Uh, I, if I could claim this, I actually came up with the name Shit for this video. I'm really proud of that. The first Big Brother video, and that's uh, Wee Man Jason Akuna on the cover, later Jackass Star. I don't. We went with Shit. This was the premiere that I was talking about where uh, these uh, guys from Huntington Beach that came up to see it, they uh, took control of the scissor lift that was in the warehouse where the premiere was you know, drunk afterwards, after the premiere was over, and raised it up to its like highest level, people on top, and they drove it off the loading dock. I don't think anyone was injured, but like all this like weird fluid leaked out of it, like as it like was like sitting there on its side, and we had to pay like a pretty big, pretty hefty bill. Yeah, hydraulic fluid probably. Yeah, um, <laughs> I did like a lot of editing at the end, where I like I sat next to like these, like one of the filmers was called, was named Winco. Oh, fuck. Eric Matthies was the other filmer. And I, I can't remember like which of them said this. I think it might have been Eric Matthies, but there's a part in this video where somebody's pissing on like a clown puppet or something like that. As we're editing, he's like, I can't believe I have my name attached to this project. I might have seen it in the past year. Sometimes I, I don't know, I'm just sitting drunk in bed and I watch stuff on YouTube. Well, I'd have to say the first one is my favorite just because like, you know, it allowed for the other ones to get made. My favorite part in these videos is, um, I think it's the third video, it's called Crap. And it was filled in my backyard, the house that I was pointing out on that Daywon song graphic where it shows my, my street that I used to live on. So I had this big backyard with like a deck in the back, and so I'd have a lot of parties there. And we filmed, uh, it was the first event that we of this kind, I think we had two, it was called the Depends Olympics. So yeah, we filled this, filmed this event, it started out with like the 100 beer challenge. So like these, like Chris Naratko, Carney, Cossack, and this other guy um, that worked at World, Aaron, I think was his name. They drink, they'd have to drink one shot of beer every minute until they drink, finished 100. And then after that, then they competed in these events, like in an obstacle course, all like wasted by then. In the crap video, that's probably my favorite. <laughs> And one day, we might all be... No, and, and we filmed it pretty early in the morning. It must have been a weekday or something, but yeah, we didn't hear anything. Another time, though, in my backyard that I was more concerned was when they uh, shot this cover for Stance Magazine. You know, it's like all action sports oriented, like more than one discipline. So they shot a cover of the Jackass cast in my backyard. And then after they shot the cover, um, they started lighting off bottle rockets in my backyard. And I was like, 
Don't aim them towards my house. Do not shoot them like at my neighbors. The sumo wrestling was later, and that was also in my backyard too, but that was later. And for the sumo wrestling, I was at work, and they just, I think they asked me if they could come over and shoot at my house, but I had to be, stay at work. So they just showed up, and my roommate was still at home, and he was on a first date. <laughs> And he was like sipping wine, sitting on the deck in my backyard, and the guys showed up in fucking sumo suits. And he's like, yeah, I think that really got my relationship off to a good start. Um, I, I don't, I'd have to look to check. I don't think I actually was. Maybe I was. Yeah, I, I, my name's here, so I must have been editor. Yeah, I wrote this statement here, that's me. I wore glasses. Dill. This is uh, Simon Woodstock's company. I, don't, I think it might have been called Woodstock at that point. There's like not even any, well, his name's there. But anyway, so he got, I think Jimbo Phillips did this illustration. Um, so that's Rocco. And this, these were characters I came up with, with for World, the Devil Man and Flame Boy. And the, that had just um, taken off and it was getting real super popular. As a dig at World, what Simon Woodstock had uh, this graphic drawn up with Rocco getting butt fucked. I don't know how you got the, this issue without this being torn out because when we shipped these out to shops, Rocco had the warehouse workers tear out this page wow. before it went out. Um, so yeah, I don't, this is kind of rare. I, I don't I knew this ad was going to be in the magazine, but that was after we, we sealed the deal with Flint. So I had cashed out like, and Steve had cashed out too with Flint. I didn't really think about like what any reaction would be. Obviously, Steve didn't like it, so he had it not shipped out with this in it. For years, I, I thought, like, you know, I really should have told Rocco that this was going to go in the magazine. We could have avoided this whole fiasco. After that, it dawned on me that, like, that would have been a big mistake. Because what happened was uh, Rocco ended up suing Simon Woodstock and, uh, yeah, putting him out of business. I think they settled, he, like, Steve got cashed out, like, with 100 grand. So he got 100 grand out of this. And I think, like, if I had warned Steve, <laughs> Like, Steve would have been like, what the fuck, man? This is a great opportunity for me, like, to, like, you know, sue their ass. Yeah. Jason Dill, I, I think, like, this uh, scene from Winnie the Pooh is called Pooh Sticks, where they, there's a famous bridge. I don't know if it really exists, but they, they drop sticks off one side of the bridge and they watch them float down the river or the stream. So yeah, Dill was just like into this whole A.A. Mill and like this illustration style. I think Piglet was in the original uh, composition if I took him out. Yeah. I might have added like this, the bushes and stuff. No. Yeah, we did for Rocco's uh, third board called the Rocco 3. It had Winnie the Pooh on it. We didn't get a cease and desist for the skateboard graphic when it came out in like 89. But then when we started our snowboard brand for World Industries, we had the same graphic but on a snowboard, and that was like maybe 96. Well, that caught the attention of Disney, so we had to settle out of court with them. The mistake that World made was uh, when we had to turn over the paperwork for that graphic on the sales and stuff, the name of the graphic said Pooh on it. Because otherwise we could have argued that it wasn't really Winnie the Pooh because in the graphic he's wearing sunglasses and kind of in disguise with devil horns. If you're gonna bite a graphic, you know, don't name it after the, the copyright infringement. No, they're pretty much lost. I mean, I think aesthetically, aesthetically this looks good, but it's just copied out of a book, so it's not really one of my favorites. Yeah, another one that I copied out of um, just an image was an Alphonse Mucha poster from the Art Nouveau era. He wanted that. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah, it would have to be like a three-way tie between Blind World and 101. Yeah, I think I did a Kane Gale graphic. Yeah, I think it was when that World Flame Boy stuff was going off, and uh, <laughs> so that would have been like 97 or 96, and that's when 101 got shut down. That was a bummer, but it was great while it lasted. Yeah, it'd have to be the Not a Satan one. No, I lost the artwork for that. Was that? Yeah.
Well, I like the Henry Sanchez Terminator graphic because that like, had a really good, it was really a novel approach because it was a combination of a silkscreen graphic and a slick bottom graphic. And what happened was Sean did a painting that was used as a slick bottom, which was, it was a Terminator, like from the movie with Schwarzenegger. So he did a painting of like the skeleton, robotic skeleton or whatever from the Terminator, airbrush painting. That was the slick bottom. And then over that, we silk screened the portrait of Arnold Schwarzenegger, like before, you know, the end of the movie where he just is like stripped down of all his skin or whatever. So that was pretty cool. Yeah, that was. And uh, there's this really steep learning curve for airbrushing. And uh, I think he may have mentioned this in his book, Disposable. That was when we still uh, just kept track of our hours and turned in invoices like, and got paid an hourly rate. So he spent like a lot of time on that graphic. And what we do is, uh, like Steve was busy with all, um, you know, myriad other things. So we would just give her the invoices directly to this accountant that worked there. And uh, they'd usually get paid with no questions asked. So that was probably his most expensive board graphic that he did. Uh, I did a few graphics for Gershon. Yeah, I don't want to talk about negative stuff, but when I was art directing back then, if the skaters like had, wanted to do their own graphics, like Corey Shepard did a few of his, his own graphics, like he was in a painting, and so he had a few of his own paintings come out on, gra on graphics. But that was also like in the late 90s, early 2000s, when I was doing the, bl the Blind Reaper character, and <laughs> those were really like selling well. So then when I let the skaters do their own graphics, like sometimes the management would be like, what the fuck, you know, like they, they weren't into it at all. And like Gershon did one where it was just a poem that he wrote. <laughs> so the whole thing was just poetry. And yeah, I don't think anyone was into that. I think Gershon was like left blind pretty soon after that came out. Yeah, I didn't even bother to read it like, yeah, that's a graphic. <laughs> uh, I did, yeah, up to a certain point, up till about early 2000s. Yeah, these are the Big Brother trading cards <laughs> for our magazine, Big Brother. This came out with the issue number five. So, you know, first 10 or so issues, we try to have a different gimmick with each magazine. So issue five had these cards and in total there was like over 30 um, in the series or the pack and uh, maybe like three or four came with e each issue. So um, I don't know, find them on eBay now. Like one of the things with our magazine was uh, it had a lot of like inward focus on our own staff, which you could take as uh, being kind of like narcissistic, but usually people were shown in like a really humorous or bad light, so it wasn't really that narcissistic. So we gave ourselves trading cards and like skaters got, skaters got trading cards too. Tim Gavin might maybe, because <laughs> there's a picture of his dick on the back of these, one of these. Um, I don't know, let's see, Howard Stern. No. I guess I'll pick this one as a favorite. It's a portrait of Adolf Hitler, but the card isn't a Hitler card. The card is for the artists that painted this. It's this art team or like this uh, duo of painters from uh, Russia they're, and they're, their names are Komar and Melamed. They also have like a really cool concept to like their projects. Like this one is like, you know, as being as they're the Russian Jews, like, they just were trying to emphasize like the irony of like, <laughs> like a nice, nicely done portrait of Hitler just because it's so iron ironic that they would do that. And then later on it was like slashed, like there's actually the, the knife cut here when it was exhibited. So that kind of even adds to like the impact of it. Why didn't I get a Big Brother train card? Like, well, for one, I don't really like being photographed. That could have had a lot to do with it. There's a lot of really straight ones like, you know, that's just a cool trick Cream's doing and then has like a bio on the back. I think Clive wrote a lot of the bios. On the back of Tim Gavin's card, um, he might not have been that stoked on because it has a picture of uh, Stan Stanley, I think. Yeah, um, that's the tip of his dick right there. He used to call his penis Stanley. And I'll, oh, we also used to give him shit because like that's when like all the, the skaters on the team were really into tagging and his, his tag was shitty spelled S-I-H-I-T-E. Um, so he could, like, he liked being able to say, yeah, I got it, sh my tag is shitty. Probably about four years ago. Uh, I'd have to say Slayer. Slayer. We're done. Thanks, Mark.
You guys cheated. <laughs> Goodbye.